and thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Mark Martin. A suicide bombing rocked the capital of Afghanistan Wednesday morning. The bomb was detonated during rush hour in a highly secure diplomatic area in Kabul, about 400 yards from the German embassy. Officials say at least 80 people are dead and close to 400 people are seriously hurt. Most of the victims are civilians, including women and children. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the bombing. This is considered one of the worst attacks the city has ever seen. Head to CBNNews.com for developments with this story throughout the day. North Korea keeps raising the stakes in its threats to America. The communist government indicates it's developing technology to wage a nuclear attack. So when is enough enough and would the United States consider a first strike? CBN's Washington correspondent Eric Rosales takes a closer look. Earlier today, North Korea test fired a ballistic missile. A preemptive nuclear strike against the U.S. The missile exploded within seconds. This test um, constitutes a direct threat. We've seen the headlines of weapons tests and the fake but provocative videos. North Korean nuclear missiles destroying what appears to be Washington, D.C., the Capitol, and the White House. Dictator Kim Jong-un claims his regime can strike the United States with a nuclear weapon. Meanwhile, he continues to test capabilities and to add to his stockpile of weapons. So what's stopping the United States from taking action? What's most important to us are the territory, the interest, and the lives of our allies and friends, uh, and not necessarily solving North Korea. Retired Lieutenant General Chip Gregson served as an Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration. He agrees with the Pentagon's decision to take the approach of deploying military assets, like the anti-missile defense system known as THAAD, to the region. Gregson adds, however, it may require sending a stronger message, like putting nuclear weapons back on the peninsula. No defense is perfect, so we do need to make sure that we have a deterrent capability beyond just having a robust defense. So I think every administration starts off by saying all options are on the table. But then when you look at what our equities and interests are in that region, it goes beyond simply eliminating North Korea. Retired Air Force officer Carl Baker says with Pyongyang's nuclear weapons getting more sophisticated, it would be difficult to swiftly knock out the entire program. Baker believes North Korea would retaliate against any U.S. strike by going after the South Korean capital of Seoul and the 25 million people in the area. I contacted the State Department where a spokesperson told me, together with the international community, we will hold Kim Jong-un accountable for his dangerous and reckless actions and serious human rights abuses through a robust international campaign. That effort includes China, but Baker admits while China might influence a relationship, it cannot necessarily control North Korea's actions. They aren't happy with North Korea developing nuclear weapons either, but again, their, their primary equity is stability on the peninsula. Roughly 85% of North Korea's external trade is with China, and many believe cutting off that relationship is the only thing we can do at this point. However, top military officials at the Pentagon tell me we have substantial military forces near North Korea and are there for reassurance. Eric Rosales, CBN News. Daily street demonstrations in Venezuela are continuing against the socialist government of Nicolas Maduro. Dale Hurd has the story. In the second month of almost daily protest against Venezuela's socialist government, thousands of opposition supporters marched toward the center of the capital, Caracas, only to be tear gassed. Even opposition leader Enrique Capriles was gassed and had to be helped from the scene. This elderly woman who was tear gassed says, I am sick, I've been searching for the medicine that I can't find. But the police are upset because people want to gather on a street corner to protest. At least 60 people have been killed in the two-month-long confrontation and another 1,100 have been injured. Thousands of young demonstrators calling themselves the resistance have been on the streets fighting for democracy, willing to do whatever it takes to win the fight against President Nicolas Maduro's dictatorship. Venezuela's crisis is man-made, combining terrible economic policies with the loss of human rights. Severe shortages of food and medicine, along with hyperinflation, have Venezuelans yearning for what they once had and what most other Latin American nations take for granted. Once South America's richest country and a wash in oil, Venezuela's government under Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro 
took less than two decades to destroy the nation's democracy and economy. And dictatorships this badly run, and with a very angry population, need a lot of tear gas. Dale Hurd, CBN News. In the congressional investigation into Russia, President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, has agreed to release some documents to his Senate committee. ABC News reports that a source told them that a narrowed subpoena made it easier for Flynn to provide the material without waiving his Fifth Amendment rights. Meanwhile, the investigation continues into the president's son-in-law and advisor, Jared Kushner. ABC also reports that investigators want to know why in December he met secretly with officials at the New York branch of a Russian bank. The network reports that branch was previously known as a U.S. base for Kremlin spies. The White House was asked if or when the president knew Kushner was trying to set up back channels with Russia before he became president. I think that assumes a lot, and I, I would just say that Mr. Kushner's attorney has said that uh, Mr. Kushner has volunteered to share with Congress what he knows about these meetings. So far, the White House has not denied that Kushner tried to set up the secret communications. Comedian Kathy Griffin is saying sorry after she released a graphic image of President Trump's severed head in a video yesterday. It showed Griffin slowly lifting the bloody head, describing the project as an artsy-fartsy statement. Griffin later apologized. I sincerely apologize. I am just now seeing the reaction of these images. I'm a comic. I crossed the line. I moved the line. Then I cross it. I went way too far. The image is too disturbing. I understand how it offends people. It wasn't funny. I get it. The Secret Service is now investigating Griffin. Coming up, its capture sent shockwaves throughout the Jewish world, and now it is raising new hopes for Israel. Find out how the Jewish Temple Mount stands as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Welcome back. It's a key element of biblical prophecy involving the return of Jesus Christ to the earth, building a third temple in Jerusalem. Now there's a movement in Israel to make it happen, and it was made possible once Israeli troops captured the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in the Six-Day War in 1967. Chris Mitchell brings us that story. On June 7, 1967, Israeli Brigade Commander Motegor made an announcement the Jews had waited to hear for some 2,000 years. Retaking this ground was important for a number of reasons. For one, it's where King Solomon built the first Jewish temple. After the Babylonians destroyed it, Zerubbabel laid the foundation stone for a second temple that was later expanded by King Herod. It fell at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD. When Commander Gore declared that the Temple Mount was back in Jewish hands, it rekindled hope for a long-awaited third temple. The Six-Day War was a miracle of biblical proportions and um, was a, um, a cataclysmic opening of a, of a new era for, for Israel and for the whole world. Rabbi Haim Richman of the Temple Institute is dedicated to rebuilding the Jewish temple. He sees the time since the Six-Day War as a prophetic shift. It would be hard, I think, not to see what's happened in the past 50 years as a tremendous uh, jumpstart, a tremendous fast forward. It's, it's, um, it's more than prophetic. It's like a kiss from heaven, you know, it's like a divine kiss. It's, a, it's an intimate brush with the reality of God's compassion and love, uh, and he keeps his promises. The Institute shares a key connection to the battle for Jerusalem. Its founder, Rabbi Yisrael Ariel, served with the 55th Paratrooper Brigade that captured the Temple Mount. After the victory, a Jordanian guide gave them a remarkable tour. His job was to carry the company machine gun. There's a very beautiful photograph of that. He actually, the first night of the liberation of Jerusalem, he, he was given the task of um, guarding over the spot of um, the Dome of the Rock, which of course we believe is the Holy of Holies. The story though that he told us is that the soldiers were on the Temple Mount and it was just like the first hour or so. 
and uh, they were approached by a, a Jordanian fellow in Western dress who explained that he was the official tour guide for the Jordanian parliament and he offered to take the soldiers and show them the sights on the Temple Mount. And uh, he takes the soldiers, you know, the, the rabbi there, and he says, uh, well, this is exactly where um, the sanctuary stood. This is where the, the altar stood. And then this is where the menorah stood. He tells them all these things about the history of the Holy Temple. Finally, the rabbi asked him, why are you telling us all this? And he said, well, we have a tradition from our fathers, they from their fathers, that one day the Jews would wage a war and conquer this mountain and rebuild the Holy Temple. And I assume that you're starting tomorrow. And I want this to be my part, my part in helping you. What was their reaction to that story? Well, gosh, I guess. <laughs> Yes, they were pretty surprised, but the bottom line is, in hindsight, it doesn't look like we were ready. 50 years later, that's changed, with the Temple Institute preparing blueprints and gathering official temple elements, such as the priestly garments. Richmond is also dispelling myths about the temple on today's digital loudspeaker, YouTube. Let's start at the beginning. What was the Holy Temple really all about? All of this means talk of rebuilding the temple is no longer considered a fringe idea. Today, there is a lobby in the Knesset of how many members of Knesset that are constantly speaking about Jewish rights to pray on the Temple Mount. There are members of Knesset that actually talk about the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Do you understand that 20 years ago, these people wouldn't have been given a moment on prime time television in Israel to say these things. They would have been laughed out. So a few years ago, this was considered fringe? Zealots, lunatics, peculiar. Today it's mainstream. One of those members is Yehuda Glick. Ten years ago, there was not a single member of Knesset who ascended the Temple Mount. Today, we have 20 of the Knesset members who are interested in ascending Temple Mount, praying on the Temple Mount, and are part in the battle for the redemption of the Temple Mount and for bringing the Temple Mount back into the center of the next, next step and the redemption process. Richmond sees the temple through the eyes of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote 3,000 years ago that God's house would be a house of prayer for all nations. It means basically that there's a God in the world and that the best is yet to come, and that we are so connected to him and to each other and to that purpose and to all humanity. And it's just a wonderful privilege to be here with you today, to be looking out over Jerusalem and to realize that we're living in probably the most important time in history. If you believe in the God of Israel and you see his hand on his people and you understand the tremendous uh, changes that have gone on over the years, you see that the one who brought us this far isn't finished and will keep his promises. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, The Temple Mount, Jerusalem. Wow, some breathtaking footage in that piece. CBN has produced a documentary about the Six-Day War. It's called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. An encore presentation of the film has the theaters on June 1st. Get your tickets today by going to inourhands1967.com. Up next, they're the largest group in America, but the least churched. But that's not the whole story. Find out why Christian millennials are flocking to other countries to answer the call to missions. Millennials are the largest generation in America now. They're also the least churched group in the country. But the negative statistics don't tell the whole story. As Caitlin Burke shows us, many millennials are traveling out of the United States to spread the gospel around the world. Each new generation gets measured against their parents and grandparents in a number of areas, including faith. The difference for millennials is that they're growing up in an age of nonstop news and social media. If you are 30 or younger, chances are your belief in God may be on the decline. Have millennials gone godless. A new study shows that young people are abandoning the Bible. According to research, this generation scores low on attending church, praying, and making religion a priority. But it's not all doom and gloom. When it comes to millennials, millions remain deeply committed and active in their faith. It's just they're doing it their own way, and they're uniquely equipped to serve on the mission field. This generation is the most globally engaged generation we've seen. They're the most cross-culturally prepared generation. Many would call them the first global generation. Two out of three of them have passports already by the time they're university students. They're so globally engaged already, 
I think they're, they're, they're ready to answer the call to missions and to go. Every three years, the Urbana Conference brings together InterVarsity USA and Canada. Students meet and investigate God's call to world evangelization. Urbana 15 director Tom Lin sees a growing interest in justice and compassion-related missions. Millennials care holistically uh, about communities, and so not just bringing the message of the gospel or the message of Christ, but living it out. So it's both word and deed, and we're seeing millennials uh, much more interested in committing to these types of holistic mission. Like we make our video in 2014, way. couples Katie and Jeremy Daggett and Jacqueline and Jake Blair followed their passion for missions to Peru. They fit right in the Christian Urban Development Association, or CUDA, one of the organization's goals being to overcome cycles of poverty. Christian urban development, that, that Christian word at the, on the front end is, is really important. Um, we do all of it because we believe what Jesus did 2,000 years ago is what gives us motive and, and purpose and and really hope uh, in, in this context where we see wealthy and poor in the same city, where we see someone who's doing really, really well, is very established, and then someone who's on the, on the edge of dire poverty. So that, really that situation presents some, some unique opportunities and we try to address those with, with CUDA. Jacqueline, Katie, and Jake also put their medical backgrounds to work in a local hospital developing a diabetes program. Jeremy helps teachers improve their reading program success by starting libraries in local schools. One of the things that, you know, that looks like as the kingdom breaks in is that young kids read better and have better opportunities for the rest of their life. That's part for us, that's part of reconciliation for them. And that's part of mission work for us. As all four use their skills to improve life for the Peruvian people, they individually focus on simply building relationships. And when you look at Jesus' life and what he did and how he made disciples, he focused on a few guys and he poured a lot into them. And from there on, they changed the world, just a few guys. So when I think of my call to make disciples, I want to have a quality influence on a few people. And then those people can have a quality influence on a few more people. And then growth is then exponential. And sometimes it means walking down the street, going to the market, uh, running errands, uh, going to the, to the center of town and, and trying to meet people, uh, sharing some of who I am, starting to learn who they are and eventually moving that forward in terms of, of a uh, sustaining and important relationship. A commitment like this for a young adult brings a number of challenges from starting over in unfamiliar surroundings to raising children away from family. Being here, we've had to learn a new language and a new culture, and in reality, we feel very ill-equipped to serve the people here. And so, really what happens is, through our weakness, God's strength is shown, um, and when, when things happen for His glory, we know that it's Him and not us. I think one of the main ones is being away from family. Um, luckily, it, we have the technology to FaceTime or Skype with our family as much as we want and get to see them. Now that we have a child and that is our parents' grandchild that we have um, here in Peru away from them, that does make it a little harder as well. Despite the challenges, these couples remain passionate and hope to continue their call to missions. I feel like God's call for us here is the, could be the same call for any Christian in the world. Um, and that is to, to be a part of God's mission of blessing people and bringing people to know Him better. Our prayer is for the kingdom to come and for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now we find ourselves in Arequipa, Peru. So our prayer specifically is for His kingdom to come and His will to be done here in Arequipa as it's being done in heaven. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Arequipa, Peru. Well, it's wonderful to see millennials on the mission field all over the world doing the work of Christ. Well, stay with us. There's more of CBN News Watch on the way. Back in a moment. CBN's Orphan's Promise is helping Syrian refugees who have fled to Lebanon to get away from Syria's devastating civil war. The war is now in its sixth year and more than a million and a half refugees have flooded into Lebanon to find safety. Orphan's Promise and Heart for Lebanon have helped more than 300 Syrian children who otherwise wouldn't be able to go to school. 
They not only get an education at the Hope School in southern Lebanon, it also provides nutrition and discipleship where kids can learn about forgiveness and the love of Jesus, and their lives are being transformed by the hope they have found in Christ. That's awesome. Well, that's it for now on CBN News Watch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at CBNNews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. And you can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com or talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.